Hello, and welcome to the Configuration Management Panel with James Turnbull, Igal Kushvoy, Luke Keenies, Narayan Desai, Adam Jacob, and Brendan Straycheck. Oh, I didn't ask your name before. Straycheck. Straycheck. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm James Turnbull. I'm moderating the panel this afternoon. Uh, we're just going to be discussing configuration management with a number of the founders and guys who are heavily involved in configuration management tools. Uh, we're going to kick off with a few questions from me, uh, hopefully really easy ones. Um, and then if you guys uh, want to jump in um, and go from there, it would be great. I'll get everyone on the panel starting from the left, uh, I'll here to introduce themselves and talk a bit about the project that they're involved with um, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, James, and thanks for all everyone that came here. Uh, before I start off, I just want to say thank you to all the folks that showed up. Uh, you know, I realize you're representing very different tools. I'm really excited as one of the members that helped uh, set up this conference to see you know, so many different configuration management tools represented. And I'm also really excited because each one of the people here is kind of a hero in the sense that they, have, they saw a problem, they built a solution, they put it out as open source so other people could benefit from it and uh, helped improve the art and science of configuration management. And that really excites me. It's not so much which tool wins, but you know, the fact that we're moving forward, and that's really exciting to me. So uh, my name is Egal Koshevoy. I'm the author of Automated. Um, my background is that I'm a business technology consultant, which means that I spend more of my time uh, working with clients to try and understand what their larger business needs are and often building solutions for them in languages like Ruby, Python, Java, on top of things like Linux. Uh, system administration is something I do, but it's part of the process of creating a solution for the client. That said, I've, had, uh, I've spent about 17 years doing system administration. I've uh, managed system, about 500 systems at a time for companies like Oracle, using completely custom-built tool sets, using things like Perl and Bash. I've uh, managed 20-plus uh, operating systems at a time for companies like Intel using CF engine setups with tens of thousands of lines. Um, so I, I definitely do system administration, but again, it's part of the, the bigger picture of what I'm trying to provide. And so uh, because I am more of a software engineer than a dedicated uh, system administrator, the uh, tool I've put together kind of has that more of a flavor of making it easier for folks that are trying to look at it from a programming standpoint uh, to apply. My name is Brendan, and I've been working with uh, CF Engine since about 2003. Before that, I was primarily doing system administration, um, first in an academic environment and then in, uh, for various companies, and doing some consulting also. Um, I've been a uh, big part of the public face of CF Engine, uh, answering a lot of the mailing list questions and writing some of the documentation and tutorials and things like that. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to uh, shed some light on the newest version of CF Engine. I'm Luke Knies. I'm the founder of the Puppet Project, and I've been doing system administration for 10, 12 years. I actually started here in Portland, and uh, in 2004, I started the Puppet Project after doing what Brendan's doing for CF Engine. I did some consulting on CF Engine for a while and then uh, decided to start the Puppet Project. I've been doing that full time since March 2005, and uh, yeah, it's been great. Hi, I'm Narayan Desai. Uh, I, uh, I guess my technical job title is Principal Experimental Systems Engineer. Uh, I work at Argonne National Laboratory, and I, I basically occupy kind of a strange role that's halfway between researcher and system administrator. So I uh, uh, I do research on high-performance computing, system software, and system management stuff, and uh, doing a good job of the system management end of that means that I sort of need to keep one foot in system administration. So I run a variety of uh, experimental and uh, uh, exotic systems and need to make them work for researchers. So I've been working on bconfig2 since uh, about 2004, I think was our first public release, and I've been working on sort of bconfig overall, including the failed bconfig1. Uh, since uh, 2001 or 2002. Um, the basic problem that we were going at was we had a lot of configuration problems because our environment was extremely uh, uh, heterogeneous. 
uh, because basically we needed to buy whatever our researchers needed. I started off as a, a pure sysadmin, and we needed to buy basically whatever our researchers needed to do their work. And so that meant that we ended up with a bunch of weird systems that we needed to make function properly and together, and we had a relatively large staff to support them, and we needed to basically make the machines work together and make the administrators work together. Uh, I'm Adam Jacob. Um, I'm the CTO at OpsCode, um, and I wrote Chef. Um, Chef is a configuration management tool, which I'm probably sure you all already knew since it's a configuration management panel. And um, I uh, have spent the last uh, 12 or 13 years as a professional systems administrator um, building all sorts of automated systems. Um, a couple years ago, I started a consulting company called uh, HJK Solutions, um, and we specialized in building fully automated infrastructures for web startups. So that meant you know, everything from bootstrapping all the way through to app deployment and monitoring and trending and any management. All of that stuff was fully automated and uh, interconnected. And so from that experience, we, uh, we wrote Chef. I also like to mention that uh, I'm the founder of Productive Labs, and we're moving to Portland. So we're going to soon be a Portland company, or maybe we are officially right now. It's hard to say exactly. And we're hiring Ruby developers and sysadmins. OK. Um, I might start back at the end with Adam again, but the, the first question I had was, um, what do you tell non-technical people who do? And I'll, I'll prefix that by uh, uh, I, every time I change jobs, I get an email from my, my parents saying, can you explain what you do for a living? Um, and, uh, and I usually have to pop, pop up a couple of paragraphs they can cut and paste. So I'll start, uh, I'll start at the end there. Sure. Um, first off, I, uh, I usually start by telling people I'm in technology as a really just like super broad lob. Um, and then they either go, oh, and then they walk off, and then uh, everything's cool. Um, and then if they, uh, if they look interested after that, they go, well, what exactly do you do? And I'm like, well, um, we help people build infrastructure. So if you think about it in terms of um, you know, infrastructure being like building roads, having trains, that sort of thing, um, what we do is help people build infrastructure for computer networks. Um, and that usually seems to work. So I can give the answer that I gave to this question when my mother asked about two years ago. Uh, I basically uh, told her that uh, uh, I work on software that makes large numbers of computers work effectively for single problems. And, and so that's a, a good unifying theme for the things that I work on. I do my best to let my wife answer this question because she's, she's not in technology, so she's better at it than I am. Um, but mostly I tell people that I write software that allows, that allows people to tell, to say what they want the stupid computers to do, and then it makes the stupid computers do the work for them. I found that hands-off data center management is a good sort of buzzword phrase that encapsulates things that most people, even if they don't know very much about computers, can relatively quickly understand. Um, sometimes I oversimplify and say centralized computer management, though that's not always true, um, or just general uh, computer automation. I often end up saying something along the lines of, uh, I help create high-quality software applications, cool things like nice websites and business applications. And I often don't end up talking about things like automation tools because that's part of what creating a quality application means to me. It's just a step in that process. OK, um, if you've got questions to go along, just throw your hand up and, and wave wild at me, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, so originally, uh, We'll, so I guess we'll start in the middle with, with Luke. What problem were you trying to solve? What were you trying to achieve? I'd say that the main problem I was trying to solve was the state of maintaining computers. Like the, the tools available to maintain computers I thought was, was essentially embarrassing. Um, you look at the, the, the organizations around the world, they're almost all using different solutions. The vast majority of them are using some solution that, that some person at their company wrote five or ten years ago and everyone hates but no one hates it quite enough to replace it. Um, no one wants to write a replacement tool. No one's quite willing to bring in another tool that exists outside. No one was quite satisfied with the available tools. No one wanted to spend $5 million on Opsware or Blade Logic. It was just really poor. And so I, I thought it was possible to write a relatively simple tool that would make, it, make you able to describe what you wanted your computers to look like and then have the tool take care of making that a reality. And then as you change that description over time, it should make that that new description also a reality. Um, and the, the main thing I wanted to do was to not have this tool be an end result, but to have this tool be a stepping stone 
for building an ecosystem of competent automation tools so that we could look up and in 10 years have as sophisticated a collection of sysadmin tools as the web guys have uh, for providing web services or as the developers have for, for being, you know, you look at the developer ecosystem today and they have extremely rich tools. They have 30, 40, 50 years of process and history and tooling and discussion and publishing and the sysadmins are missing all of that. So I, I, I really wanted to build not just a single solution but a tool that could be the first step towards having that kind of rich ecosystem around sysadmin tools. So uh, about, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I was at a, a, a workshop at Lisa about configuration management, and I was talking about the mechanisms that we were using for configuration that weren't working very well for us. And uh, I realized that what we really wanted was uh, diff and patch, except for system configurations, right? And this sounds like a, a really simple thing to do, but it turns out it's a lot more complicated because there's no a unique representation that's canonical of, of system configuration and things like that. And so that's kind of the guiding idea that has uh, formed the, the basis for the architecture of bconfig, the, the basic idea that you can interact with configuration uh, in a way that the tool does the legwork, but it tells you sort of what is going on in a way that you can replicate it easily. Um, so in terms of the actual problem that I was trying to solve, like I mentioned, we had these uh, uh, wide range of resources with a bunch of people uh, trying to manage them. And the real problem that we were running into wasn't a technical problem. It was the uh, sort of social problem of configuration, right? They were trying to collaborate on building a configuration that worked across a wide range of machines. And it was really terribly dangerous to use uniformly across the system because nobody ever had enough global information to make it work properly. And so uh, the other sort of main tenet of bconfig's design is that the system should be observable and you should be able to tell what's going to happen before you deploy configurations. Um, I started from kind of a, a, a different place because for me there were, there were already a bunch of tools um, that were great examples um, of how to build good automation toolkits, right? Um, when I started building Chef, Puppet already existed, CF Engine already existed, bconfig already existed, Automate it existed. Um, all those tools existed before I started. Um, and the, the problem that we really were trying to solve was the, the next layer in the onion, which is that um, because we were running this consulting company that did um, fully automated infrastructure, um, it wasn't as easy to get to 100% coverage with automation as we wanted it to be. Um, you know, it was possible, and we were doing it, and it worked, but um, all of the tools in the chain were falling down on us at some point when we got when we tried to link them all together so that we really were having a really deep systems integration problem. Um, and the other problem we had was that we were going into so many different client environments. We did 12 different deployments in a year and a half. And part of the problem we ran into was that they were all different in their own little way, even if their stacks were theoretically the same, right? So just because you're a Rails app doesn't mean that you're actually like anybody else's Rails app. Like in your own way, you are kind of a unique little snowflake. And there's data in there that you need to have in order to actually fully automate your entire infrastructure. And we had trouble getting at that, imp at that data. We had trouble um, using external sources of information in order to influence the infrastructure. Um, and so we really wrote Chef because we were trying to build a configuration layer um, that would let us then kind of move up to that <laughs> systems uh, integration layer um, effectively. So the problem I was trying to solve was uh, I had a lot of machines. I had a lot of different machines running lots of different OSs, lots of different tools. Many of these tools were very tricky to set up. You know, it was awkward, and the, the ways to try and manage them were tricky and unpleasant in many ways. Um, I'd spent eight years working with CF Engine. It solved some problems, some basic ones on its own, but many of them I was very frustrated because I ended up having to write lots and lots of external programs that would try and actually perform the heavy lifting involved in managing the systems. And, and the, the big part also is that because I focus on delivering solutions, I didn't want to spend my time fussing with configuration management. I needed to have it done. I needed to spend like a day or two on a project and be done with the automation. So having a tool that would enable me to very easily take care of these things and create a nice reusable set of recipes that someone could look at, read, uh, understand what was going on, and then be able to easily uh, replay onto a different machine so that, you know, if, if this hosting provider's servers 
they went out of business or they went down, they could very easily create a new set of them. Um, so anyways, the, the approach that I used was trying to, the realization that when, when I tried to do something complicated with a tool like CF Engine, I would have to write screen loads of code just to integrate with other things. And so my approach was basically, you're going to be, have to be coding things anyway if it's going to be complex. Let's make the portion where you're writing some code to describe the changes that you're going to make to a system as easy as possible. And so that was pretty much what I did. There are a couple of different aspects of uh, this for me because I'm not the primary author of CF Engine and um, CF Engine is a lot older than most of these other tools. When CF Engine was first written, I was, my experience with computers was probably limited to Oregon Trail. And uh, so that was in 1993, I think. Originally, um, Mark wrote it when he was a graduate student who was uh, forced to manage a number of heterogeneous machines. And he, like most people still do nowadays, hacked together a collection of shell scripts using PS and Bash and Perl and WGET and all of that to try to make things a little bit easier and um, quickly realize that this doesn't scale very well, is very brittle, and is very hard to reason about in any kind of formal way. So the original version of CF Engine was a sort of replacement of those shell script tools, but with some idea of a theory behind it so that he would be able to think about what it meant to reason about configuration management and if he couldn't find ways to avoid problems before he actually had to stumble into them before noticing them and then um, you know, hacking the tool to work around something or needing to uh, um, deal with poor decisions in the past. And uh, so th there have been a couple different iterations of theory that CF Engine has been based upon, but I think that's probably the most thing, the, uh, the distinction between CF Engine and the other tools that um, have been mentioned so far is that CF Engine takes the idea of um, theory and formal reasoning around configuration management as primary rather than just, um, even though it was originally designed as a practical response to a replacement of shell scripts, um, it evolved into a uh, theoretical project more than a practical one, though um, certainly there are, there's the practical tool that has come out of it as well. I hope that answers the question. I yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, this one I hopefully will provoke a little bit of controversial response, which is um, uh, it's a two-part question. One is, what is the best thing your product does and what is the worst thing it does? So what is the, what is the best at doing and what is, it, what is the worst part of your product that you would uh, happily rewrite from scratch? And uh, hopefully some, some people in the audience that might provoke a question or two. Um, Ryan, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, so the, uh, the thing that bconfig I think does best is it's built around this validation model which actually can be used to inventory your system. So it can tell you things about your machines before you tell it anything. And even once you, uh, uh, so the, the validation model is built around this notion that there are two uh, pieces of data in the machine, right, or in your network. There's the specification of the way that you want your machines to be configured and then there's the data about the way that your machines are configured. And bconfig is basically the entity that um, mediates between these two. It'll describe differences, it'll allow you to move things from one column into the other and, and things of that sort. Um, this is actually uh, an important aspect of the architecture of bconfig and uh, as far as I know, this is the only tool that's really been designed to work this way explicitly. Um, oh, it does exactly that. Does it? Mm -hmm. With uh, all of the discovery stuff and the, the full validation? Oh, okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Um, so, uh, the last time I looked at it, it wasn't quite there. So, um, but the yeah, this is an old argument. But yeah, this is <laughs> this is quite quite an old <laughs> argument, um, and I think we might mean slightly different things uh, as well. I think so too. Um, <laughs> I, I totally think you mean different things. <laughs> so, so was the food fight scheduled for now? Um, uh, tomatoes aren't any rotten. So uh, they wouldn't uh, let me take the, the, the phone cupboard bats through customs. So, uh. <laughs> so. This notion is, is, I think, pretty important. Um, that's allowed us to build different sorts of processes. Uh, and so we've worked very hard to make it so that you don't, um, uh, you don't actually impose much in terms of process on the people that are using the tool. And, and this, is, this is the thing that we really learned that made bconfig2 not bconfig1, that you can't impose processes on administrators. It's just a really bad idea. 
Uh, and so that's, that's really the, the goal that motivated the Beaconfig 2 rewrite back in 2003 and 2004. Um, so the thing that it does the worst, well, so as somebody that's uh, uh, more of a, uh, a researcher, I, I hate to say that I'm an academic, but um, I'm more, I've got one foot in that world. Uh, there are always things that can be rewritten. Uh, the bits that I actually wish I had modeled a little bit differently, we're finally getting around to fixing, but we haven't fixed all of them yet. Um, so we picked some slightly poor abstractions early on and uh, we're finally figuring out how to fix those in a, a sort of robust way. Um, and the... No, Ryan, what do you mean by abstractions, just to clarify? Um, for well, that. so the, um, the entities that we picked, um, so the, this is gonna get very detailed very quickly. Um, basically I'll, the validation... I'll jump in if anyone looks like they're falling asleep. Um, okay, so the, the, the basic idea of the validation model is that you can build a collection of entities that can be collectively validated in order to figure out if the machine matches the specification. Uh, and so it's very important to be able to build these in a, uh, in a safe and consistent fashion uh, so that they're not internally inconsistent, right? So for example, it's very easy to write with any sufficiently complicated configuration tool a, a specification that functionally fights with itself, right? Where there are aspects of the configuration that aren't internally consistent. And so early on, we thought we made a bunch of decisions that um, uh, allowed you to completely specify configurations in a way that it would always be consistent based on the rules where the server would take care of any sort of disambiguation. But uh, it turns out that the specific problem was we split POSIX types into multiple things. And it turns out that uh, you could have different things that are both claiming jurisdiction over a particular POSIX path in the file system. And so this has ended up being sort of a, a long-term thing that, that's sort of stuck in my craw for uh, quite some time. And we're finally getting around to fixing it, so that's very exciting, but it's not quite there yet. Um, let's see, so the things that Chef does really well, um, Chef has been really flexible in a bunch of different environments um, and have, has really enabled a lot of people to build exactly the automation system that they really wanted. So um, for example, Engine Yard built uh, their new hosting platform on top of Chef um, and they wired Chef into all of their pre-existing systems. So they had pre-existing customer databases that described what applications they wanted their customers to run. They had all sorts of pre-existing stuff um, and they didn't have to go back and like refactor those systems in order to make them totally managed. All they had to do was extend Chef to talk directly to those systems. Um, and doing so was really easy. Um, and so I think that's probably the thing that uh, at the moment um, that Chef has done the best. Um, the thing that uh, I would love to rewrite and we are rewriting um, is, is we decided to use uh, OpenID for node authentication, which I thought was incredibly clever and a super great idea. Um, uh, in reality land, uh, OpenID uh, is really great for human beings. It's super cool. Um, when you decide you're gonna do it with a machine, there's no reasonable specification for how to decide how the machine should authenticate. Uh, therefore, what you really wind up doing is crippling OpenID and coming up with your own kind of ridiculous validation format um, that only ever works for you. Uh, so uh, somebody actually was giving a chef presentation in Raleigh uh, like a week ago and mentioned this fact, and the room actually laughed at him spontaneously when he said it. He was like, it uses OpenID for nodes, and everybody was like, bah ha ha. Um, so uh, uh, next time I make a decision like that, I'm totally going to try it on a room and see if I get spontaneous laughter, because if so, I am totally the idiot. Um, and so we're gonna fix that by um, refactoring that to actually do like uh, EC2 style uh, signed signature headers. Um, but that's certainly the thing that we uh, got wrongest. So automated is really good at a couple things. One of which is uh, it's really easy to get started with. Uh, you install Ruby, you install Ruby Gems, you type gem install automated, and you've got yourself a complete setup. You don't have to create certificates, you don't have to set up client server relationships, you don't have to uh, muck with weird files in Etsy. It's like a shell, you type automated, you get an interactive prompt that you can begin typing commands into immediately. The shortest automated program is an empty file. <laughs> the shortest useful program is probably a single line. So it's very easy to get started with it. And because it's, again, an interactive, you can use it as an interactive shell, uh, you're able to poke around to see what is it going to do. And you can even enable a preview mode that'll tell you, here's the underlying Unix commands 
that I'm going to run when you try and tell me this to perform a certain kind of action. So that makes it real easy to get started with compared to some of these other tools. Um, as well as because it tries to, exp it, it, it exposes the underlying way that it actually interacts with the system to you uh, through a series of APIs. So depending on how, com how complex you need, you, you can use some very high level wrappers to lower level method calls. But the beauty of that is you don't have any kind of uh, intermediate layers that you have to write one sort of language to interact with for this or another one to interact with that. For the most part, anyone that's ever written a shell script or is comfortable, for example, with you know, writing basic programs with a language like Perl or Python or Ruby or PHP or Java can be able to look at a recipe and go, oh, I see what this is doing. I recognize what these commands are because they're modeled very closely on the Unix uh, underlying commands that you use, like mkdir. Um, and so that makes it very easy to be able to not only get started, but also begin creating sophisticated automation sequences because it lets you program them. The part that it does poorly is when I explain things like I just explained, some people kind of go, oh my god, I have to program. And that can be a hard barrier to get over. Uh, Ruby, which is the language that you're interfacing with, is surprisingly easy to work with. And again, the subset that you're realistically going to be using for automating your systems is a very small portion, and it's very similar to probably a couple languages you already know. However, getting people over that threshold of uh, this is an imperative approach, you're writing some, something that actually is a program, kind of uh, makes people a bit spooked. So that's been hard to get over at times. So I'll have to echo Narayan and say that the social aspects of these things are almost always the hardest. And um, in the case of CF Engine, it's sort of a, um, you can take one little bit of it and, and get started without very much. But you sort of have to understand which little bit to start with to, to do that. And there can be a sense of information overload. Um, so I'd say the learning curve is probably the thing which CF Engine can um, uh, improve the most on. That being said, um, uh, a lot of consistency has been gained with the new description language of CF Engine 3, so hopefully that should help um, with the learning curve problems. Um, what it does well is that there are a lot of problems in system administration which almost everybody runs into at one time or another. And CF Engine makes it very difficult to shoot yourself in the foot in this way. It gets pretty much all of the basics right so you don't have to worry about them. The correct way to update files so that your machine doesn't do horrible things if it's working on a almost full file system, for example, or um, why you might want to think about pull versus push architectures. If you're just a sysadmin and you haven't thought about these things from a larger perspective, often um, these things don't occur to you, and only when you have a system of 500 machines that you need to, uh, you know, iterate through your SSH for loop on, do you realize that pushes are really not so good most of the time. Um, and the, the overall design of CF Engine makes it very unlikely that you'll stumble into one of these kinds of problems. So I think that's probably the thing that it does best. I think what Puppet does best is it scales, it, it's really simple to start with, and it scales very well from a simple proof of concept to a functional, useful infrastructure. Uh, the best example of this is Google is a big Puppet user. They're using Puppet to manage their entire corporate infrastructure now, all their Mac laptops, desktops, servers, all their Solaris servers and engineering workstations, all their Linux servers and engineering workstations. Um, and the, the reason they got started doing this was someone was giving a talk at one of the Apple conferences, whichever one was in January, a year or two ago, and in the course of the, of the talk early on said, it's really simple to do. You can start with this very simple configuration, and that's actually useful and helpful. Um, one of the, the Google Ops Mac admin, Google Mac Ops admin, was in the audience at the time and said, I'll try this out while the guy's talking. By the end of the talk, he had a useful configuration that was managing an important part of his infrastructure on part of his test infrastructure. And that was simple enough that he decided to stick with it. And within a few months, he had scaled that simple seed, seed crystal into a real functional infrastructure. And it wasn't in jerky steps. It wasn't in, you know, okay, well, we do this little example, and then you go to real, you have to do, work 10 times as hard. It was this smooth curve from proof of concept to functional, useful implementation. Um, and in general, it works really well for that. I think probably the thing it does not so well is that it's, 
it's both a tool and a framework. And most people really only are aware of the tool aspects, and very few people do any sort of extension to Puppet. Um, there is huge opportunity for uh, internal plugins, for adding functionality, for connecting to Puppet in all kinds of interesting ways. But almost everyone sees it as kind of a closed box. And as a result, and, and obviously to some extent, it's because I haven't done a good job of advertising this ability and I haven't you know, shown good examples. But um, people tend to think, oh, well, if, it, if Puppet doesn't do what I want right now, then it's Puppet's fault and I'm not going to, you know, I, I can't get what I want done. And as a result, people tend to have trouble doing um, very, very complicated, very sophisticated configurations. The very simple stuff, not even the very, people do complete uh, sophisticated infrastructures all the time, but that, that last bit can sometimes be more complicated because people don't look in the code, people don't understand the system, people kind of see the, the documentation and go, oh, well, that's all it can do, and so they tend to, you know, write new programs and stuff instead, so. So I'm, I'm going to move on to a, a slightly different topic unless anyone has a, has a question I'd like to pop up with. No, okay. Um, so in terms of, uh, I guess, we'll call it, we'll call it usage, just in terms of conceptual sort of stuff, um, and I guess I'd like the answer to be sort of uh, in two different facets. One, one, one is um, what's the, the, the most, uh, most important usage concept that users have to understand in order to use your tool? And secondly, overall in, in the sysadmin world, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people in the audience who manage lots of lot, chunks of infrastructure. What do you think is the most important concept a sysadmin needs to understand in order to manage infrastructure using a configuration management tool or, or to understand configuration management? And I might start with Adam Daniel. Hmm. Um. So I think the, the most important concept you need to understand in order to start using Chef is that you want to start, and this is very similar actually I think to the steps you take to start using Puppet, um, it is you're really starting by describing the state you would like a resource to be in, right? So rather than writing code that says, you know, make this directory and copy this file over here, what you say is this file should be here and it should be in this state, right? Um, so I think that's probably step one um, for Chef. Um, in terms of what I think people, sysadmins at large, need to understand in order to um, kind of build better automation, more automation, um, I think it's the concept that automation exists in order to save you time and trouble. It also exists in order to make your life better in that when when you start to really hit that automation curve where you've, you've gotten a lot of automation, you wind up in a new place where before you would have to say no when somebody asked you for something because you would have to go do all this work. If somebody showed up and was like, oh, I'm, we need 30 new servers uh, next week, you'd be like, yeah, well, I need a car. So you know, who, gets one, who gets a new one first? Um, because doing it by hand would never happen. Um, so by doing, by, by choosing to invest in automation up front, what you're actually doing is creating a world where you get to say yes exponentially more often. So, you know, if all of that, if, if that entire process is automated, you as an administrator or as a software developer, now you get to show up and be like, hey, I need 10 more servers. And he goes, why are you talking to me? Like, just go over there and hit the button and you'll have 10 more. Um, and that's a very valuable thing. And I think that's the, the most important thing that I would want to impart to people. So probably the uh, thing to, to, that you need to understand to be able to use automated effectively is to, at, at a first glance when you look at some example recipes, it looks like, huh, this is basically like a shell script with some extra things sprinkled in. It's uh, additional Ruby type syntax. Uh, and so they end up thinking that it's it may be too simplistic. And so one of the things you have to appreciate is that all the methods that it, all the things like mkdir that it's executing are actually quite a bit more clever because automated is describing the actions, not the resources. Each one of these methods is smart enough to check what the state is. So for example, when you type mkdir foo, it's actually going to go and check how does this particular platform implement uh, creating a directory are you, and finds the right way of doing this, uh, determines whether or not you're running in a preview mode. and it'll only create this directory if it needs to. All the automated commands are descended from this philosophy, including the much more complicated ones that do anything down to, you know, installing, uh, creating new users, uh, modifying files, and so forth. Um, the, uh, 
the big things that I really wish people would uh, take out of uh, to improve their approach to system administration just has to do with appreciating that there has to be a process for how you manage your systems that's well understood and that not only inco incorporates some kind of uh, technical component in terms of, for example, in the past it used to be documentation that described the steps of how you get a system to a certain state. With these tools, thankfully, there's now an executable documentation that describes how we do this, and that's helped immensely. But it's also vital to just make sure that there's a clear set of communications and rules about how we end up deploying things out into production so that our users aren't surprised that, you know, that, that there isn't a that there isn't any kind of surprise in terms of what ends up going wrong or right, and because a lot of these problems can be just solved by just simple communications if you approach it right. So I'll sort of answer these two questions together because I think they're sort of the same thing. Um, it's not so much about efficiency all the time as also correctness. Sometimes correctness implies efficiency, but not always. And if you're faced with a choice between the two, you almost always want to pick correctness over efficiency even if it takes you longer to get a system that can meet your SLA, that's what you really care about is the desired function at the end, not the way to get there. And um, so CF Engine uses a descriptive language like um, um, Puppet and Chef in order so you don't have to worry about the inter intermediate steps. The uh, original theoretical insight that Mark had was that um, the design should be convergent which is sort of a complicated way of saying um, it impotent. That is, when you apply the, um, the policy to a machine, it should result in the same kind of end behavior, or at least getting closer to that end behavior every time you do it, so that you're not going to ever go backwards. Um, whether that implies allocating more resources to your problem, or editing a file in a certain way, or installing a package, or restarting a service, or whatever, you want to converge towards the, an end state, and you want an easy way of specifying that end state, and you want to make sure that that end state is correct um, and without uh, too many unintended side effects. So I think it's the, the first part of that that you need to understand to be able to think in the CF Engine way, and the second part of that that helps you be a better sysadmin. So to start using Puppet, you don't really have to understand anything more than you understand today, today as a sysadmin. Um, most of the things that you're going to do at first map really well to things you already know very well, things like files and packages and users and groups. The thing that Puppet does a little bit different, um, the, the, the fundamental insight that Puppet brought was that there are a lot of things that you manage as a sysadmin that don't map to independently addressable entities. Um, hosts, uh, anything that's in like the Etsy directory, so like users, there are tools to manage users, but there's no such thing as a user on your machine, right? You can't go and say, show me the user because it's spread across a couple of files in your, in your Etsy directory. There's no such thing as a host or a, a port or a service or, because there are different commands and different files that provide the, both the model for these things and the means of interacting with it. So what Puppet does is it, it creates this concept of a, of a resource that's basically an abstraction over these entities that you already know about, you already think about. No one says, you know, go run the Etsy init.d thing, they say go start the service, go stop the service, go create the user, go remove the host, go change the host's IP address. So what Puppet does is it says, look, let's stop talking about files, let's stop talking about commands, let's stop talking about executables, let's talk about the thing we want to manage. What are the attributes of that thing? Well, a user has a home directory and a shell and a UID and a GID. And I don't really care how that happens. I don't care if it's in NetInfo or NIS or on a file or if it's maintained by gnomes. None of that stuff matters to me. What I want is this behavior on this resource. And so Puppet builds that abstraction that allows you to stop worrying about the individual bits and focus more on the entity that you know and care about. And this is really great because it means that as you transition from your Mac to your FreeBSD box to your Solaris box to your whatever, the same concept holds true. The concept of a user is still true across all these platforms. The, detail, the implementation details vary, sure, but you don't actually care about that. And that transitions nicely into the thing that I think anybody who's using configuration management really needs to understand, and that's that the behavior is what matters more than anything else. It doesn't really matter if you do 99.9% .9 of what's necessary to get a service running, but you actually have it running with the wrong document route or you have it running on the wrong port or something. If the people who need to use the service that you're trying to automate can't get the service they need, then you have completely failed. So focusing on the behavior and not worrying about 
the details or the commands or the bits or file formats or anything like that. If you've got a tool that forces you to think about file formats or forces you to understand command arguments or any of those kind of things, what you're doing is you're using all of your brain space on things that, that really you don't actually care about. No one's going to sit at a party and be like, hey, guess what? I know all the 9,000 arguments to LS. No, no one cares. Focus on the behavior. I think maybe Theo Schlossnagel knows. Theo probably does, but he probably doesn't try to pick up women using that knowledge. Not anymore. He's <laughs> married. Yeah. So, oh, that's fun time. so that's, it's really yeah, all about behavior, seriously. basically. That's, that's, that's the thing you need to focus on in your configuration management. And um, obviously, getting to that behavior, you should do that as, as, a most, as efficiently as possible. But yeah. So to make effective use of bconfig, you really need to understand the declarative model that a bunch of people have already mentioned. Um, I think that the, the big difference between doing manual system administration and starting to use bconfig is that you really need to sort of retool your uh, mental model of, of what your systems are and how they work together and how they compare to one another. Um, I found in talking to a lot of sysadmins that they've got a very sort of craftsman mentality about the machines that they build, right? Machines are purpose built and they uh, worry about a lot of uh, details of configuration and, and things like that and they get every machine sort of just so to start with, right? And frequently the uh, assumption is that they will do things in a consistent fashion from machine to machine and uh, there are sort of a bunch of assumptions about the way that that process happens that aren't always particularly accurate. Uh, and so when you switch over to using bconfig, uh, the big shift is you really need to start um, factoring your environment in terms of similarities and differences, right? This is, this is a pretty generic configuration tool idea really more than anything else, but uh, you need to get used to thinking of your machines in terms of uh, abstract classes that correspond with the way that you're configuring them, right? So uh, I configure all of my Linux machines this way, or I configure all of my web servers that way, or things like that. And so as you start thinking about your machine in that, or your machines in that light, you can build a, a sort of infrastructure of groups that correspond to it, and that's what you hang your configuration on. Right, and this is not a particularly uh, familiar concept to people that have been running machines one at a time. And I find that this is the thing that takes time. Frequently our users start out and they build one map and it works fine for the first couple of months and then they think, well, this is okay, but there's this other thing that I need to do that I didn't really represent very well in this and, and they end up refactoring it. Okay. Um Talk, let's talk about typical users. So um, you've all, all the tools here represented here have, have a user base. Um, I'm curious, is there a typical user? Is there a typical user for, for your tool? And, and if so, who, what, what do they look like? Who are they? Um, uh, are they cute? You know, all that sort of stuff. And we'll start. So typical users are ones that they're comfortable with a Unix command line. They're comfortable with the idea of writing a bash type script. Um, and so that type of thing doesn't phase them. And I, I think in a way to, to respond to something Luke mentioned, because I, I recognize that this is a big difference between tools like Puppet and Automated is, um, having used a number of the tools mentioned here that try to pretend that there is a complete beautiful abstraction that they can provide for describing how your system works, and then there's this horrible reality that every single release of the OS is gonna include some wacky weird thing. Your, this some package is just going to do something weird that I, as the creator of this tool, can't you know foresee. And so one of the approaches that I've tried to use with Automated is to make it as easy as possible for you to abstract these sorts of things uh, across machines, rather than me having to figure out what the complete solution to this is in advance. Um, did I answer both of those? Sorry. <laughs> So, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically just they have to feel comfortable with the whole idea of programming. And if, and then fundamentally, if they don't, you know, maybe one of these other tools is more closer to what they're uh, comfortable with. CF Engine's been a GNU project for a while, so um, it has a pretty big foothold in the free software um, community, people who, who want to automate a large number of machines. Um, we have some pretty big installations. I think that the biggest one I know of is 30,000 machines. Um, and there, there are some other similar, similar sites that have um, also large nodes. But I'd say probably if there's an average, it's probably a, a mid-sized site of somewhere between 100 and 200 machines, um, servers and desktops. 
Um, I don't think any Puppet users don't have computers. I'd say the average one has one or more computers um, and is probably responsible in some way for making sure they do what they're supposed to do. Uh, I, you know, there are really large installations. There are quite small installations. There are, there's a kernel developer who uses Puppet to maintain her single laptop. Um, and there are people who maintain servers, workstations, laptops, all kinds of things. Um, there are people who build, you know, developers who show up and spend two months learning Puppet and learning aut system automation and then get their stuff working in the way they need it to work and then they disappear and you never hear from them again because they don't have any questions or problems. Um, and then there are people who show up and spend, you know, half their time in the community participating and helping and asking questions and answering questions and contributing code. Um, I, I keep looking for that magical average and I'm not sure that one exists. Um, we certainly have a lot more sysadmins than non-sysadmins, people who have some sort of responsibility to maintain systems, but we get frustratingly incompetent novice users, frustratingly competent developers. Um, yeah, I, 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 other than the computer thing, it's hard to find a, a common characteristic. Unix. We've got Windows support coming any day now. <laughs> Windows as well. So I don't have any, uh, sort of similar to Luke, I don't have a particularly good answer. Uh, a lot of our users, uh, we only hear from very occasionally with sort of esoteric bug reports. Pe some people show up immediately, some people never show up. Uh, it, it's really sort of hard to say. Um, a lot of our users uh, are in positions where they don't want to spend very much time on their configurations. I'd say that's a, a pretty common characteristic. Uh, of, of people using bconfig. And, um, uh, and I, it's sort of interesting, Brendan mentioned the, the GNU project, but the, the, the FSF actually runs bconfig, interestingly enough. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know exactly what that says, but um, I need to get at least one dig in in this panel. Uh, <laughs> Attacking comes later, that was the second half. <laughs> oh, is there's, 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 yeah, there's, there's I a, didn't see that part of the There's a demarcation there. Dave um, uses puppets, speaking of this. Um, <laughs> um, Let's see, so I think right now Chef, uh, Chef is young enough that um, we, we still kind of have an early adopter pool, right? Um, and so the early adopter pool for Chef uh, have primarily been developers. Um, they've been usually, uh, typically they've been web shops. Um, it, that shouldn't be super surprising since we, we kind of was born out of our doing consulting for people who had web applications. Um, so I, I think we're, we're new enough that uh, we still kind of do have kind of an early adopter who tends to really resonate well with Chef. Um, so software developers, probably. Um, there's some systems administrators just too, Brian McClellan, not that you don't write code. Um, and it, it, they are all cute uniformly. I would just like to get that out there. Um, they're all good looking. Um, So I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, in terms of our uh, largest installations, uh, we were pleasantly surprised, sort of a lot users who don't tell us that they're actually using bconfig, that two of the top five systems in the last top 500 list were run with bconfig. Nice. Uh, the uh, top 500 list is a list of the 500 largest uh, tightly coupled HPC systems, and it comes out twice a year. So we found this out in November. Um, so, is there a, an unusual user? Is there, you know, there's obviously, a, is there a, a somebody using using your tool to manage a nuclear reactor or you know maintain an evil plot against the world? Uh, we'll start at the, start at Narayan. Sure, put me on the spot here. Uh, yeah. Unusual users. I don't know. I I think that uh, in terms of what they're doing, most of our users are are, are relatively uh, run of the mill admins that want to do, oh, sorry. Uh, most of our users are relatively run-of-the-mill admins that want to run their computers more effectively. Um, I, I can't really think of anything that is particularly striking places that uh, uh, BeaconFig is used. Uh, we had somebody running their home network out of one of the little plug computers. You know, like they just plug into the wall socket. Um, I thought that was kind of nuts. Um, not the least of which because, you know, you need to, like, be running Ruby. Like, there's this whole stack that they had to do. Um, there's a bunch of stuff they had to cross-compile. Like, they really, really, really went out of their way to, to like, get that thing on a plug computer, which was awesome, um, but a little weird. One of the kind of surprises in terms of uh, users of Automated is uh, probably also one of the larger users. Uh, they're managing hundreds of interactive kiosks with it at places like museums, like, which was kind of an odd place to have it, but the neat thing is they're also managing everything from their development environments 
for these with this tool as well. Um, but the neat thing about automated is it doesn't have scaling issues because as it, it operates in the same way that, for example, Bash does. It doesn't do networking. And I mean, you can make it talk to a network, but there's no central server. So as long as you have a way of distributing recipes, each machine executes its own copy. So you can, ult you can have as many uh, machines running it in a group that you need. I know AMD has been pretty um, public about their use of CF Engine, and I think there are a number of other uh, Fortune 500 types, but um, I'm not sure if all of them are, are public about it, so I don't really want to uh, spit out too many names and then get yelled at later. So, I think Google is twice over the, the most unusual user of Puppet because they most people don't manage um, laptops and desktops to any serious extent, but Google has so many Unix Laptops, laptops and desktops that they have a, a bigger problem than most companies have, and so um, that's actually where they started managing, started using Puppet, and uh, have replaced CF Engine and all the other machines in their corporate infrastructure. But the other, uh, and so using like laptops, which we had Ohio University uses Puppet on their laptops too, but um, Google uses it at a scale that I don't think anybody else does. And the other thing is, I think it was on uh, the the Mac guy at Google got Puppet running on. I believe it was his Android phone although it might have been his iPhone, I can't quite remember. So that's kind of unusual too. So um, I guess leading on from Igor's comment about um, architecture, um, can each of you describe the architecture of your, of your tool and how it differs from the others and why that's best and please don't hit anyone? <laughs> uh, we, might, uh, we might start with Brendan. So CF Engine is pretty flexible as a framework, but um, the generic user has a pretty standard configuration, which usually includes um, one central point of authority, the so-called server, CF Engine server. Sometimes this is actually more than one machine to provide a high availability, but there's still one central point of truth that all other machines draw their um, policy from. This is not required, but it is um, relatively easy to understand, and it's relatively easy to deploy, and it gives you a pretty big bang for your buck. So. Um, that's what most people do. You have a, a single place where you publish your policy, and then clients will periodically download it. Um, I think the, the uh, default is uh, hourly updates of policy and execution, so that any, convergen any uh, divergences will be um, repaired approximately within an hour, whether that's a new package rollout, or a service update, or a patch, or whatever you've built into your policy. So you essentially have a, a client-server model that uses pull to update. Um, and this model is particularly strong because it even allows you to uh, configure machines that are currently off the network, down, or do not yet exist. Because um, as soon as they come onto the network with the appropriate credentials, they'll update their policy, execute it, and then be a um, fully functioning and contributing member of society. Puppet has pretty vast architectural flexibility. Um, the default recommended architecture is almost exactly duplicate CF engines, not coincidentally because I spent a lot of time using CF engine. Um, it's a pull model where all of the code is on the server. A significant departure from CF engine's architecture is that the code never makes it to the client. We only, we compile down a client specific configuration, send them only that. It's all data, there's no code, there's no private information that that host shouldn't have. Um, this gives you the principle of least access where hosts only get access to the information they absolutely require. Um, that being said, we have quite a few users and customers who um, don't use this model for various reasons, either because it doesn't fit their security model or because they have satellite offices that are too far away or on two unreliable links, and they ship all their configurations to those clients, and each client runs the configuration independently, you know, like uh, Automate it does. Um, and then there are other configurations where people uh, compile the, the catalog via some other trigger mechanism and ship the catalog to their clients separately. And um, be Maybe you should explain what the catalog is. Uh, it's the thing. It's the main stuff, man. Um, <laughs> so the catalog is the list of all the resources that a host cares about. Um, you know, all, all the resources we're managing, all the details, details we care about those resources and, and how all those resources are related to each other. Um, internally, it's a bunch of stuff that you don't care about, but, um, yeah, so this is the, this is the entire configuration that the client cares about, but critically, it's not the code. There are no variables. There are no functions. There's no code that runs on the client. What runs on the client is the, is the Puppet package that you've already shipped, and this is all data that you're sending to the client. Um, yeah, so it's very flexible, but... 
Uh, so the architecture of bconfig is uh, similar in a lot of ways to Puppet. Uh, the same sort of literal bits apply where the central server uh, compiles down a configuration for the client that includes everything that it needs. And so this limits the amount of computation and uh, sort of the prerequisites for the configuration client to work properly on, on the So the I copied that. that from bconfig just for the record. Um, and so uh, the... The, the only bit that I think ends up being a little bit different um, in terms of this uh, is that we found that places that have bconfig managing a lot of discrete resources will frequently set up a single server per sort of administrative domain, yeah. and then they'll use version control tools to push changes back and forth between them. And so, uh, for example, we've got something like a half a dozen different clusters in our division, and each cluster will have a head node that has its own bconfig server, and there'll be a lot of shared information between them, but they will be distinct bits that are kept in the local repositories. Um, this makes people a lot more comfortable than, uh, uh, than if there's somebody on a different machine that knows nothing about their uh, resources that are pushing changes into their repository. And we found that we can build relatively good synchronization processes that allow people to feel like they have an adequate amount of control when pushing changes around. Um, so Chef's uh, architecture is um, similar to Puppet and uh, apparently also to bconfig, uh, uh, although in a way it's actually closer to CF Engine. So, um, so here I'll explain that seemingly, con it. that seemingly contradictory statement I will make sense of. So uh, you can run Chef in a couple of different ways. So in the simplest of modes, um, you point Chef uh, at a set of cookbooks, uh, and then it executes them. The cookbooks are just on local disk, or they're in a tarball somewhere that you download, um, and Chef will run them, right? So no server, just run some stuff, right? Um, there is a client server model, um, where which is uh, basically you have some version controlled set of cookbooks that manage your infrastructure. Um, they get served up to you from the server. Um, the server knows what cookbooks uh, are necessary in order to build the configuration for a given node, um, and ships adjust those cookbooks to the edge. Um, so, and the code actually executes on the edge. So uh, unlike Puppet where, or bconfig, where you actually compile a catalog on the server and ship just the catalog, um, Chef actually ships the code itself to the edge and executes it there. Cool. Uh, so Automator has a kind of a different approach. Uh, it ultimately is Ruby with some extra fixings. Um, the, uh, you basically install Ruby, you install this package called Automated, you get a complete Ruby environment, you get to use Ruby syntax, you have the access to things like functions and variables and method calls, and can extend it in the same way. So the recipes you write that describe how resources are set up you can use all the t kinds of programming knowledge that you already have. So you know you can drop things like breakpoints into the middle of a recipe and inspect the state that it's got right now so that you can debug it, which I found very valuable. Um, things like, uh, so the, you could theoretically you know, execute, you know, fire up the interactive shell and type in a single command. Uh, normally you keep the automated uh, commands in a file you can have something called a project, which is basically a structure that contains multiple recipes and associated uh, features such as describing what roles your machines have. Uh, for, another, for example, you know, these, these are database servers, these are Postgres servers, these ones are running in a DMZ somewhere and have to have some special configuration. Um, these are the intranet servers and so on. As well as it has a concept of fields, which can, are a way of abstracting configuration information such as uh, I'm a, I want you to connect these machines to these machines. I want you to create a website with this name under this path. I'm using, uh, want you to end up creating a user with this name. But having those kind of variables extracted out of your code that's actually being executed. And you have the, the actual functions looking into this repository of fields to determine how to operate. Um, in terms of the, how do you manage multiple machines with this, it's actually ridiculously simple. Um, so the way I usually work with uh, automated is I have a very simple setup which is, starts off with I execute a shell script which installs Ruby, installs Ruby gems, installs automated, does a checkout from a version control repository such as Git or SVN, a set of recipes, 
I have some kind of way that I, I, I push in a secrets file. The secrets file contains things like passwords that I don't want in the revision control repository, <laughs> and upload those to the host. And then I'm able to tell the machine, go apply these recipes. And, it apply, and usually the approach is you have one top level recipe which calls all the rest of the recipes. But you can execute individual recipes. Automated does not own your machine. You can have multiple scripts called by different users on a single machine. So you don't have to figure out how to get them to interoperate. They're standalone. So the way you'd end up dealing with, for example, a network is you can either use a pull or a push model ranging from you have some kind of central management machine which basically does a, a, the equivalent of a very simple for each loop of telling each machine to go and do something or a pull type model where you pretty much just say you add something to cron that says go and check back in check out uh, pull the latest changes from the revision control repository the latest re uh, recipes and apply them so that's all there is to it I'd like to highlight one of these differences, which has probably already been made clear. Um, but on uh, CF Engine, almost all of the logic is on the client. And the server is really simply just a file server with access control. And uh, the converse is sort of true on um, bconfig and Puppet, where most of the business logic is on the server. And um, it gets pushed onto the client. There's an advantage for each way, because um, Puppet and bconfig can do sort of cross-host analysis in an, in an elegant way on the server that um, might be different to do in CF Engine, whereas CF Engine will scale um, very strongly because each client is autonomously responsible for all of the decision making. So Yeah, and a, a similar kind of, um, to kind of continue down that road. So Chef takes the idea for like kind of being able to look up at the whole infrastructure, right, as opposed to just a single node. Um, takes that model by basically saying that the clients can talk to the server, um, therefore they could actually just restfully ask the server a question, right? So you can actually just, within Chef, you can run a search. So basically your infrastructure gets indexed um, and you can query that index uh, and use the results to build your recipe. So for example, people automate things like Nagios that way, where they're like, hey, give me the, uh, all the systems that are in production that are running Apache 2, um, and Chef will just return that list to you and you can use it to build your configuration. Um, how, how do you handle if one of the nodes are down? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of things we do. So one, um, Chef itself uh, is also a REST API. So the server itself has an API that you can use to kind of remotely update the configuration of another system. So your monitoring system, when it sees that, the, when your monitoring system sees that that system has gone down, uh, it can actually just update the Chef server and say, hey, flip this bit that says that system is no longer uh, available, right? At which point, uh, when the monitoring system comes back around, you may actually remove it from the config. Most often, you don't want to do that for monitoring, but there are situations where you might. So on a related note, one of the things that caused us to pick the opposite model was because our administrators were, so our early users effectively were uh, very nervous about things that they couldn't sort of get their arms around. And they wanted a, uh, an infrastructure that they could really introspect pretty heavily without having to touch a lot of machines because we're used to dealing with, at this point it sounds small, but you know, multiple hundreds of machines. So that's a little bit too much to go looking at. So Puppet works with both models just fine. Um, if, you don't, if you aren't concerned about security as much, if you don't care about every machine in your network having all the security, um, having all the data for everybody else, then it works fine in the CF Engine or the automated model. Um, the big benefit of the centralized model that Puppet has is that Puppet defaults to, I should say, since again, we've got very large customers who are doing um, both side, both types of infrastructure. Um, it's a much more divided model if you go client server. You have much less information on the clients. Um, and while we have that central reasoning capability that um, bconfig and I, I guess Chef has, the benefit of, the, of Puppet is that all that reasoning takes place on the server. Your clients can't talk to each other. Your clients can't do arbitrary queries on the server. Your clients can't, you know, really do very much to the server. So you have intelligent clients to some extent but they have very limited access. Um, I, I can, you know, I know this has been a big boon for some of our customers. Um, all the government people we talk to, all the financial industry people we talk to are very concerned about the security model of the system. So um, to some extent, this was, I, I won't say this was entirely designed. Part of it was accidental. Part of it was um, cribbing from Narayan, who had a very good model to start with. 
but um, we've had a lot of success with the benefits, the security benefits of this model. And if you aren't, again, if you aren't as concerned about security, if you don't care about everybody having access to everything, then you can leave an inversion control, ship the configs out that way, and, uh, and it works great, so. I would also like to point out that um, CF Engine has also borrowed some of the uh, um, inventions of Narayan, and, uh, but one fundamental thing that hasn't really been brought up so far is that the reporting aggregator is, um, doesn't need to be associated with the file distribution part at all. And what they've described is they have a file server that also gets back stuff and then correlates it for humans to see in some you know, intelligible way. But there's no reason why that function needs to be on the server. Clients could just as well hand their information to some other system to uh, create a human viewable um, site-wide whatever. And there is, in fact, such a tool for CF Engine, which is under development. Yeah, you can configure where your reports go in public. So on the t to continue a little bit on security, uh, with the typical approach with automated, you, you often end up having one Res set of recipes describing how a machine works and often associated with one set of secrets describing the passwords that it's operating with. However, if you have different kinds of machines that need to run at different kinds of access levels, you'd basically ship out stripped copies or, or, or slightly different copies of what the secrets file contains. So in other words, you know, these machines just don't need these passwords. And the, the, this approach has worked reasonably well in the sense that the only, you, the secrets file, you keep it so that it's only readable by root. So if someone breaks into this machine, you're already hosed. So I don't go beyond trying to make it trickier than that. That said, you don't need to use the secrets file. You don't need to use the mechanism that looks up fields that's built in. It's optional. You can very easily write your own simple library that somehow interacts with some kind of a keyword server that pays attention to, for example, what IP is this coming from? Does it, is it using some kind of a, you know, encrypted key and so on? So you could very easily build that kind of infrastructure if you needed to. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the security part of whether or not you distribute the, the manifest themselves or recipes in Chef mm -hmm. to the edge or whether you compile them centrally, the, there's, there's a couple of interesting problems there, right? So one is the key escrow problem, right, which is the do you have passwords embedded in the recipes themselves, right? Do you have a line of, in a file somewhere that says root's password is foobar, right? And if so, that's a problem, right? Uh, if you check that file in to source control, that sucks. Um, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, if in, in models like, in the centralized model where you, can, where you can build the catalog, you might be able to put that file on disk only on a certain smaller subset of systems, right? Um, not ever have that inversion control, but it's still distributed out to the edges, um, right? Because it's now kind of embedded in a different way. But the the password concept there, you still need an escrow system, most likely. You'll you'll wind up needing to put that data in some other bucket and securing it in a different way and having it appear on the system if that's really a requirement. Um, in terms of whether or not shipping recipes out to the edge uh, or centrally compiling them gives the recipes themselves a security benefit, really, I, I suppose, depends on what's in your recipes, right? Um, if you have something in there that, that if it goes out to the edge and someone sees you know, your super secret way of configuring Apache or whatnot, then you know, don't do that. Um, and, and the model of any of the tools that ship that to the edge um, isn't going to work for you. Um, but for most people, they don't have those sorts of like, company secrets inside their configuration recipes, right? Like, it's not really like that. So, so uh, actually, whilst we're on the topic, let's, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about authentication and access control and security. Um, uh, Narayan, do you want to jump in there? Um, how do you handle the problem? Is it a problem? Do you need to encrypt that sort of data? Uh, Adam has well, a view there. Well, I, I think that you do need to encrypt that sort of data. Um, so we use SSL for everything. We, use, we can use client certs, or we can optionally turn them off for bootstrapping mode if it's needed. Standard sort of stuff. We can fall back to HTTP auth over non-cert validated uh, uh, SSL connections if it's needed for some reason. Like uh, we see this a lot in sort of cluster node bootstrapping. When you're building a new node from scratch, you need to do something. And while it's technically insecure, the window is small enough that it's very, very hard to actually exploit. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Chef, uh, uh, the client server parts of Chef are all just RESTful HTTP. So you run them under SSL. Um, the, like I said before and got laughed at, uh, the nodes themselves use OpenID. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, they're moving to sign certs. With automated, the typical approach is you distribute things like recipes 
through a version control repository. So often the connection is happening through something like SSH or SSL. So it works well enough for me. Yeah, I think the, um, the file distribution mechanism is sort of separate from the configuration management problem and uh, the, all of the data that goes over the network for the file server is encrypted. It uses a simplified um, SSL model that's very similar to um, uh, OpenSSH and you basically want a copy of your peer's public key if you want to make sure that you're talking to the right person and you want to be able to uh, initiate a, a protected channel. Um, so yeah, everything is encrypted and it's relatively easy to set up. Puppets, uh, so the, the, the three layers are access authorization, access authentication and authorization. We don't really have an access layer, um, so we don't do like IP-based limitations like CF Engine does, but we do have separate authentication and authorization layers. So our authentication is standard SSL. It's the same stuff you use to talk to your bank, um, and it, it works very well. It's not peer-based, so as long as everyone's certificate is signed by the same certificate authority or some peer of that certificate authority, then everyone, everyone can authenticate with anybody else in the network. Um, and in terms of authorization, most people are only running, um, are only talking to the server for, for kind of a very similar model, and so we have a default authorization that works for the standard model. Um, other than file serving, where there's a separate file serving config file that determines who can get access to what kind of files, and there are some kind of clever tricks in there where, where you can give individual access to individual files to a specific host based on um, kind of regexes and host and, and the just kind of, uh, what is it, variable interpolation in, from the host name. Um, there is a, another layer of authorization at the, at the basic API level in the old configuration, in the old system that was XMRPC based. Um, most people didn't need to use that, but it was there if people wanted to. Um, the new system, because we're switching everything to REST, um, the fileserver.conf still exists, but most people just be using the, the REST authorization file, which gives you essentially very clear IP or hostname access rules on um, any level of the resource that you're talking to. So you can say, well, this host can talk to, you know, just files, it can talk to this kind of file, it can talk to, you know, it can do reads but not writes, it can do deletes but not reads. Um, so it's a very complete authorization model. Um, and uh, yeah, you know it's good because it wasn't written by me, so. So um, uh, Brendan raised an interesting issue earlier about, um, about distributed functionality. And um, so from a, the point of view of, of, of your tool, how does it handle distributed functionality devolved? Um, are, we sh are we short time? We three minutes, I believe, don't we? Isn't it three? Why is it 3.30? Oh, till 3.30. 3.30? Wow. Okay, never mind. We've got time to fill. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I was thinking, hang on a two. <laughs> Can I go to the bathroom real quick? <laughs> distributed devolved and delegated for the audience. Yeah, so um, from, the, from the point of view of d distributed, as another you distributed functions around, um, I don't know, did devolved is something we could, we, could, we could argue about the definition of devolved, but um, uh, in terms of, um, what's the other one, delegated, um, you know, I guess similar sort of concept in terms of, in terms of can you tell other things to do things for you, um, and things like redundancy and uh, scaling and backup and uh, availability across multiple sites, stuff like that. Talk a bit, a bit about how your tools fit with that and what they do. Um, I might start with um, Adam at the end there. Sure. Um, well, that's a really broad question. Uh, so, Chef, in terms of in terms of managing uh, in terms of managing particulars of uh, of like authorization within the cookbooks themselves. Adam, I might tell you, we actually got someone who actually has a question from the audience. So I, I'd actually like to have that person ask. Yeah, so. let's do it. What's up? We'll come back to this. So the question was about convergence and, uh, and how do you handle the situation where the, the platform or the configuration management system doesn't do something you expect? Uh, well, in my opinion, convergence uh, is a workaround to a bug. Um, anytime that, you're, that you have written some, a manifest and it says, this system should be configured in the following way, um, the thing you actually cared about in stating that was the end state. All you cared about, the only thing 
was, is that system up and running and the way you expected it to be? And everything between here and there uh, is a bug uh, and needs to be fixed by someone, right? Um, sometimes those bugs are transitory, right? So you fail because you couldn't install a package because the upstream package repository was down, right? And if you just do it again, eventually the package repository will come up and magically we've converged, right? Like suddenly success is now ours. But the state in between, uh, that was a bug. Um, it didn't work as you expected. The system doesn't work. Um, and so that philosophy um, is kind of pervasive in Chef in that when, when you say what you want the system to do, um, either it's going to do it completely uh, or it's not. Uh, and if it's not, then it's actually just going to stop in the middle and be like, holy crap. I'm not quite sure what happened here, but I'm certain it was not what you told me. Um, and then a human being needs to decide what to do next. So in terms of uh, exception handling with automated, because it, you are ultimately writing a program, if your machine, if you're, for example, you, you have a syntax error, or you're writing a program that uh, describes, you know, I'm setting up this website, I'm requiring PHP, and I've got a description that's saying, you know, package manager install PHP, and the thing that the repository for that is down, you'll get a backtrace. You'll get an exception from the program. And you as a programmer can then look at it. This is kind of handy, for example, if you're using a poll model where uh, Cron will email you the backtrace so you as a, can inspect it and try and figure out what to do. Uh, but again, because this is a, it tries to use an imperative programming language type approach, you can very easily fi uh, get into that machine and uh, start executing this recipe line by line with a debugger, full features of debugger, and see where is it going wrong and why. And I found that to be incredibly helpful as opposed to some systems which make this a little too abstract because they've got too many layers and covering things up. Um, one of the other pieces was uh, that I think involves delegated was the, uh, one of the things is, so automated because it doesn't own your machine, you are able to have multiple users running completely standalone recipes on the same box. So for example, you can have an IT team that ha is responsible for one set of recipes. You have another team which, for example, is responsible for the web sphere installation, and another team which is responsible for just the database administration. And then you can have an individual user which has their own copy of automated scripts which run under their normal user account. And it's possible to have all these things running concurrently without them stepping on each other's toes as long as, you know, for example, the IT team doesn't switch over from Apache to Nginx without telling everyone. But as long as, you know, everyone plays nice, it works, you can have them living. Uh, so, um, I, 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 Gal, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly filled with horror by that as a, as a sister admin in the old school. Um, so you're, are you relying on Unix, I guess we call it Unix AAA to, to prevent your users stepping on each other? So how about people with pseudo access? How do you stop some people uninstalling one version of Postfix and reinstalling another one if they've got multiple recipes? Well, so the, maybe this is, this is something that's hard for me to understand is if I have administrators that are arguing over whether they're, no, we want to install Apache, no, we want to uninstall and install Nginx, I don't think this is the tool, the, my tool should be trying to resolve their social problem. The recipe should be clear enough that they can tell what they're doing to prevent themselves from shooting each other in the foot. There's, there's only so much I can do to help them from beating each other up, but at well, the end, it's going to do what they told it to do. Arguably, your tool should not be counseling its users, but at the right. same time, it should be detecting these sorts of problems, because so, a lot of cases where these sorts of problems occur, it's not an explicit, oh, screw you, I'm installing this version. It's yeah. this guy wants this version, and that guy wants this other version, and they aren't really talking to each other. And so the... Um, while bconfig can work in that exact same mode where you have several different instances of it configuring different aspects mm -hmm. of the system, we generally recommend against people doing that because this sort of disambiguation can't really happen in the tool. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very important to highlight this well in advance of it ending up on any sort of live sure. machine. How does, how does bconfig deal with failure? Um, well, so um, in terms of failure... We're going to talk about failure, we should probably do the... Uh, oh, yeah, well, I'll finish and then you can... Um, well, no, I think, I mean, CF Engine is like the kingpin of failure conditions, right? So, like, I, I think we need to, like, not, not, in, terms of, not in terms of it's always well, failing, it, yeah. in terms of, yeah, that, that had a little bit more Freudian stuff embedded in it than maybe I intended, but, nope, um, sure. but, but there's a lot of philosophy embedded in that, right? Like, CF Engine deals with, has a philosophical framework by which it copes with failure, so. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I do think it's not really the correct action to, if you have a conflict, to just stop in the middle. 
particularly if your uh, agent is running something like a nuclear power plant or a piece of hospital equipment or something else. You want to do as much as you possibly can and then give as much information back as possibly as you possibly can to the people who are ultimately responsible for the, um, the, the goal of the system so they can fix it. So this actually allows me to introduce one of the other central theoretical um, points which, about CF Engine, which is uh, promise theory. All of the actions in CF Engine are modeled as promises, where so a file or a service or a machine promises a certain amount of things to someone. And if that promise fails, then it can move on to other promises and try to correct those and report that you know this promise, I wasn't, I wasn't able to repair this promise, or I, I needed to fix this many things on the system in order to bring it into compliance. So um, generally, it will, if, since, since there's a single language, it can detect a lot of conflicts at essentially what would be considered the compile level. So if you're missing a semicolon, it's not going to be able to parse a single rule, for example, and then maybe it fails on that file, and then it you know, goes on to other files or other bundles within CF Engine. Um, but the whole thing is not going to die at that point, and if you have two different segments of a very large config that are both saying that Etsy password should have different permissions, then that is really a, a conflict that CF Engine can't decide. So it needs to say that it couldn't repair this promise and an administrator really needs to take a look at that code. So because Puppet is all about managing resources and in general um, resources are, are unique, there's no such thing as, you know, there's, there's no like, there aren't two users on your system or if there are, that's kind of a real problem. So um, Puppet does basically resource level conflict, conflict checking where if you have two classes that are trying to manage the same resource, then Puppet will consider that to be a compile error. It won't, that's not a complete valid catalog, and so it'll, it'll throw an exception, and these, the client won't get any catalog at all. In general, that's not a problem because the client has a catalog cached from its previous run, so it'll just use its last version of its configuration and it'll run that. Um, this is how we handle the conflict checking. It actually works really well. There are multiple ways you can segregate your configurations in Puppet, and delegation to different groups works very well. You can either have multiple modules where there's a group responsible for Apache and another group responsible for Ruby and another group responsible for whatever, or you can actually have multiple module pools where you might have your core IT group responsible for your, your main modules, and then you might have an applications group that handles just the modules responsible for the applications your organization develops. Um, so you can do delegation kind of at multiple levels within Puppet, and that works pretty well. And, and if they do conflict at some point, then Puppet will tell you at compile time that they conflict, and it'll consider the entire catalog to be invalid. You'll get a useful exception saying something like, don't do that anymore. Um, and then uh, if you get down to the client and you have what appears to be valid configuration, but during the course of the configuration, either you have some sort of invalidation, like you, you tell the, the client to retrieve a file from the remote host, and that file doesn't exist, um, what happens is the client will fail that individual resource, and then any resources that depend on that resource will also fail. And it, they won't fail in a catastrophic thing sketch on fire mode. They'll just say, look, one of my dependencies failed. I'm not going to do anything else. Um, this is really nice. Um, all the dependencies in Puppet are managed via a, uh, you essentially directly declare dependencies. And I really think Puppet's dependency system is one of the best things about it. Um, you look at any of the modern systems that handle dependencies, all of the um, package databases use a dependency graph, all of the modern service systems use a dependency graph. Um, so explicitly declared dependencies makes a huge difference and it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of ability to inspect how things relate to each other. And in, in the case of failure handling, it makes a big difference because it allows you to say, this one thing failed and I know exactly who depends on that one thing. So the rest of my configuration I know is isolated that from, from that failure. So I can essentially just carve that part of my configuration out prune the tree there, but then move on to the rest of my configuration. So, and that's, I think that so far has worked pretty well. Obviously, I would say that. So, uh, like I was saying earlier, the uh, disambiguation problem is handled entirely on the server side. And aside from that issue where we were mapping multiple types uh, in a way that didn't allow the server to do um, checking before it ships clients to the server that we are fixing, um, by the time the, the server completely generates a configuration for the client, at that point it's internally consistent. So you don't need to worry about this sort of problem where somebody says that uh, the password file should be world writable and somebody else says that it shouldn't be and, and they end up on the client and there are problems. Um, in terms of outright failures, one of the things that we've found is, is really critical is closing the loop. So 
regardless of the actions that the beaconfig client takes, when it gets the specification from the server, it figures out how well it corresponds with that specification, and it sends back information to the server describing how, what its state looks like. And this allows us to detect things like client bugs and a variety of other, uh, so client sort of logic bugs, not outright failure bugs. Um, th those are detected a different way. Um, but by and large, uh, the reporting system is the way that we really figure out if things are, are sort of going along in the way that we expect them to be. Um, so uh, the way that sort of a, a standard morning looks for uh, one of our beaconfig users is effectively they come in in the morning and they go to a web page that describes the health of their network configuration wise, right? It's the same as what you would get from Nagios except it describes how well their machines correspond with the specification that they have said they want their machines to look like. And typically, this, this display is not as, as all green as you would expect it to be, right? Something has happened by hand someplace, or some sort of configuration um, deployment has failed on one system for one, some reason or another. And uh, this interface allows them to see basically how well the configuration process is working. This ends up being actually a really important metric. People can tell how well the process is working independently of sort of eyeballing the individual nodes. Um, so, in terms of uh, delegation and, and all of that kind of stuff, um, for distributed management, frequently users will use revision control systems that are distributed to uh, split uh, where specific chunks of the configuration are, are uh, uh, sourced for a particular group of machines. Um, there are some interesting prototypic uh, workflow machines that include uh, approval and delegation for uh, fine-grained changes um, that interface well with bconfig uh, that are, are sort of the research prototypes at this point. I actually think that this is the area in configuration management that still needs a lot of work. It's a, a pretty complicated problem to actually get um, robust delegation working right for exactly the kinds of problems that we were talking about earlier where um, people start constraining what your configuration can look like without making decisions. Uh, in terms of I need this version of Postgres and somebody else needs a different version of Postgres and you need systems that can sort of do a combination of fine-grained access control and notification to interested parties of what's going on. But I don't think there's a clear winner in that space yet. I don't think so either. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap back around to Luke because this is a place where we have like a really strong and clear disagreement. Um, if, if you hadn't, I would have brought it up. So. Yeah, so uh, Luke said uh, you said that one of your favorite things about Puppet is dependency management at the resource level. That is the thing I dislike absolutely the most. Oh my God, please God, no. Um, your, uh, the, the, the reason is this. Um, when you are, there, there is an advantage to it, and, and you guys both pointed it out, which is that when you manage resource dependencies at that level, what it allows you to do is apply partial configurations. You can not, one resource failure does not stop the rest of the system from configuring. So that's, that can be really advantageous because there are segments of your configuration that really don't care about each other at all. Um, and it's nice when those, those things do configure properly, right? Like the way that your PAM config works maybe doesn't, you don't care, uh, it has no impact whatsoever on how you configure Apache, right? So it's nice to have those two things go separately. Um, in the case of resource level dependency and order, um, the part that killed me about it was that I'm maybe just, I, I could never get it right enough. So essentially what would happen is those resources need to be put in an order. You have to decide what to do. Um, and when you start to put those resources into order, you can actually come up with multiple possible outcomes. So there's multiple po possible answers to the sort that gives you the order you're going to apply those resources in. Um, and what that means is that one run might not exactly be like the next. And so you can actually have a configuration that works 19 times. But that 20th time, the sort order was different. And it was that one sort order where you missed a dependency at a resource level. And now the configuration didn't work. And you're unsure why. And so in my experience, the reaction to that wasn't, it's cool, just let it run again. <laughs> it was actually, that didn't work. Why is it that you sold me this bill of goods that wasn't real? Um, and it, not everybody's environment was that way, but mine was. Um, Chef, the, the problem of dependency tracking still shows up in Chef. Um, the differentiator is where you decide to declare your dependencies. Hmm. So in, in tools, in, in, the case of, uh, in the case of Chef, you declare those dependencies at the cookbook level, at the recipe level. So you actually say, 
this recipe needs to make sure, make sure that this other recipe has run before you run the resources in this recipe. Um, and that makes it very easy to reason about exactly what the system is going to do. It's going to behave the same way every time you can look at the file and read it in order, and that's the order in which things will be applied. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, the automated approach is arguably naive but charming in the sense that it do, you do not declare dependencies. It's imperative. The code runs from top yeah, to bottom Chef like a typical well, program. Sort of. I mean, Chef does have dependencies in that, like, if you have if you have multiple parts of the application, right? So if you have multiple, if you have three parts of your system, all of which require Apache, mm -hmm. um, there is a dependency. They include the recipe Apache, and we only do it the one time. Um, so it's not it's not imperative like that. Okay. Whereas automated is. So you'll have code that says, package manager, install Apache. Then you'll have another one that says, service manager, enable Apache, so that when your machine reboots, Apache will start up depending, you know, because different machines have a different way of enabling on boot startup. But anyways, if, if the first line fails, you want to just stop dead in its tracks and give you a trace back because clearly there's something horribly wrong. You do not want it to continue, at um, least in the automated approach. And CF Engine 3 um, is somewhat similar to Chef, right, in that you actually do declare relationships between classes, essentially, right? You, you, inside, inside a class, you're not declaring the order that they run. Does that make sense? Is that, um, is that correct? Sort of. Each, uh, so there's a, a bundle sequence where bundles are run in a certain order, but um, it will also reorder things internally based on the state in which the, the um, action would need to happen in. So basically, CF Engine does everything based on, you know, if, if, uh, based on the, the state of the external environment. So if you're a Linux machine, then do X. Um, and all of these things, these things are called classes, and they're basically just binary flags. So um, uh, if, if you're Linux, do this. If it's 2008, do this, et cetera. And you can set arbitrary classes based upon the exit outcome of a previous action. So if the agent sees that something is dependent upon a particular class, it can also see what might generate that class and do that first. So the dependency handling falls out naturally from this reliance on external state to do things. Does that help? Yeah. Um, there are questions? Sure. Um, um, does, does everyone want to describe the user interface? Let me just talk yeah. about Puppet's dependencies and for just a second, because we I, I talked about it very briefly. But um, so the the big benefit over actually having statically declared dependencies at the resource level is you can actually reason about your dependencies. Because today, um, you, you most of the systems today that people are talking about, you can't ask um, what what services depend on this package. You can't talk about individual resource level dependencies. You can say what classes depend on other classes, that's about it. So um, the, the ability to actually reason and introspect all those things I think is, is a lot, it's pretty valuable. Um, anyway, let's talk about user interfaces. So uh, CF Engine has a language, um, uh, uh, rather, um, so CF Engine 2, it had essentially a different syntax for each kind of thing that you might want to manage. This was a nightmare. Um, this happened because things sort of grew um, organically. A, people realized they needed a way to m maintain packages after a certain way, so the, the uh, language that was developed for packages doesn't exactly match the language that was developed for, say, managing files, which is another kind of resource that CF Engine can handle. Um, but in CF Engine 3, that's all been um, refactored, and everything has been modeled in terms of promises, which I described before. So um, a CF Engine policy file is essentially a collection of bundles, and each bundle is a collection of promises um, regarding the intended state of one or more aspects of the system. Some of these aspects are uh, uh, bits on disk. Some of these aspects are um, aspects of the running system. So for example, a file is a, um, a static resource and a process is a dynamic resource. Um, and you can make a promise, or the system itself can make a promise about both of these things. So for example, you could say, promise that a certain um, version of a package is installed, promise that the contents of its configuration file have a certain line, and then promise that if that, um, if the system needed to edit the file, then it will also restart the service. Um, so that's essentially the UI at the, at the base level. Um, 
there are some graphical overlays that are planned on top of that as well, but um, really the core of the system is uh, that description of promises for how you want your system to behave in, in a text file. So the primary configuration interface for Puppet is definitely the configuration language itself. It's an external DSL that bears some sort of weird resemblance to Ruby Nagios's configuration language and probably something that happened to me at night while I was sleeping. Um, and then there are multiple other aspects of the interface. So all the login goes through syslog by default, but there's a reporting process that um, multiple people have built simple interfaces to, re to report information. Um, there are a couple different web applications that people use in conjunction with Puppet, including one that Adam wrote called iClassify. Um, and then there are, so one of the things that I try to encourage as much as possible with Puppet is to build multiple tools as part of your ecosystem rather than, than trying to rely on one application that does everything. So we've succeeded this to some extent. There are separate reporting applications. There are separate node management applications. Um, one of the things that Reductive Labs will be doing this year is producing more tools that fit into that ecosystem. So you'll have um, very clean separations between um, certain kinds of data. Your report data is separate from your resource inventory data, which is separate from your node inventory data, which is separate for your configuration data. Um, those will all be web-based interfaces, other than obviously the code itself. I'm a big believer that code should be managed in a text editor and not in a GUI. So you'll, you'll, as long as I get to choose, never have to, you know, use a WYSIWYG interface to write code. Um, but other than the code bits, we're, we're adding more GUIs over time, but uh, some of those GUIs exist today. So basically there are two components of the user interface. Uh, there's the specification language that you use to tell the server what to tell clients to do. Um, these are all text files. Uh, a lot of them are in XML specifying basic uh, predicate rules. Uh, Sometimes I get grumbles from people about the use of XML, but the reason that we chose XML initially was because we can easily parse it, validate it, and generate it from arbitrary programming languages. And so frequently the way that this ends up working is that people that have deployed bconfig figure out the process by which they want their configuration to change. So, I mean, if you think about it sort of mathematically, it's kind of like the derivative of, of their configuration over time. Uh, and they implement that as code that runs periodically and changes their configuration. And so because it's a sort of stock language that uh, most of the input rules are, are uh, described in, that allows us to generate them pretty easily from whatever programming language they want to use. Um, in terms of the reporting system, we have both command line and uh, a web front end to the reporting data. Um, so if you are uh, so disposed, you can go to a web page every morning or you can be sent an email or text message, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, one, one quick bit that I don't think has come out yet that might be an interesting data point for you is the languages that our tools are written in. Um, three of them are Ruby. We have Ruby, Ruby, and Ruby at the far end, and Narayan writes in Python still, yep. and CF Engine is in C. Yeah. Um, Chef's uh, configuration language um, uh, is a Ruby, so it's a Ruby DSL. Um, the, it also kind of uh, has a couple of other interfaces. So. Uh, each resource in Chef has a JSON representation, um, and you can use those JSON representations and ship them around and run actions on them. Um, and we've used that to do things like uh, also have a Perl-based recipe writing language. Um, over time, there'll be more languages you can write Chef recipes in, um, and essentially those languages just emit JSON, which winds up going to Chef, and then Chef runs the configuration for you. Um, the Chef server itself has a web UI. Um, that lets you look at the state of what's in the system. It lets you um, look at all that stave catalog data that we talked about where it was all in the search index. Um, you can go and actually query that index and look at your data. You can look at the nodes themselves. Um, you can also use the web UI to set up roles. Um, so, you know, what does a web server look like? You can do through the web UI. Um, almost everything in Chef that you can do, actually everything you can do in the web UI, you can also do in a text editor. Um, and probably with a Ruby DSL that compiles to JSON. Cool. Um, automated is mostly interacted with by typing automated at a Unix type prompt. Uh, you get an interactive shell if you just type automated by itself. Uh, you get uh, you know, things like command line completion and uh, those types of nice features for you to interact with in a very similar way to how you interact with a typical shell. Um, you can use your favorite text editor because the language is pure Ruby. Uh, you probably have syntax highlighting av already available for your text editor. You simply save it to a file and run automate it in the file name. Uh, because it has no, there's no server component 
it, the program just is the program is basically just re-executed if you need to use it again. Um, there are a couple other additional helper scripts because Automated wants to make it facilitate bidirectional interoperability with other programs. What what that means is it makes it easy to have to write a automated recipe that, for example, fires off some Python program that does something cool. But the reality is also there's situations where you want to have this Python program that's doing other cool things that needs to find out what is the configuration of this machine. Like for example, what what is its role? You know, is this is this a web server or which group of web servers does it belong to and how should I behave? And so there are programs like AI fields, automated AI fields and AI tags, which you can say, hey, give me the field or the tag for this particular machine so that uh, my Python program can uh, interact with it. And so these two programs, AI fields and AI tags, just return things in uh, standard output as you know, either space delimited or YAML or XML output, so you, you, whatever program you're using can easily parse it, but the beauty is you can go both directions you know, using uh, automated to call other things and having other things call automated. So, would, um, are there any other questions before we? There's not that sort of, Everyone's popping up at the last minute. Last, so I'll, 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 the chap in the grey shirt. Whoever mugs the microphone first. Sorry, um, I apologise. Uh, how do you deal with, how does the tools deal with dynamic configurations like EC2 where they might have one host or five hosts or ten hosts and then none? Yeah. Um, Chef does that really well um, because it, it's written in Ruby. Partly because, because the configuration syntax is Ruby, it's very easy to write very dynamic scripts that take data from external sources. The EC2 data in particular um, is built into Chef, so it's built into OHI that it'll auto detect that it's on EC2 and it'll actually extract all the EC2 metadata um, and then put that into the index. So then you can ask questions like, hey, uh, I'm running in this EC2 environment, what is the master database server right now? What's its internal IP address? Get it back, use it in the recipe. Puppet space is the same way. Your limitation there is um, the, the period of your of your data changing related to the period of your configuration changing. You know, puppet configurations update every half an hour by default. So if your period of dynamicity is five minutes, but your puppet configuration period is 30 minutes, then you've got a, a conflict there. But otherwise, um, using external data sources is, is essentially trivial because um, it's very easy to extend puppet add, add functions and add external data sources. Ditto. Yep. <laughs> uh, Similar, except um, CF Engine will define a whole bunch of classes automatically. Um, it, it could easily support EC2. I don't know if it currently does. Um, and anything else, as long as there's an API to get to that data, it can um, also uh, query such things. So automated defines a bunch of things like classes. It, it basically describes them as tags. Uh, that describe things like, for example, what your architecture is and so on. Many of these can be detected automatically, but then you, as the user, can very easily add additional ones. Um, in terms of, for example, how do I look, how do I get it to understand what the IP of some other server is, the, the approach that would probably be easiest with automated would just be to write a, a very simple shell script that is run out of cron and just populates some file that your other programs look into. So other questions? So is a chap here in the color chat? So um, I'm happy to. So just, the, just email me and I'll answer for everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless your question is about whether or not you should do resource level ordering, and then you should totally email me and I'll answer for everybody. Yeah, and um, I'm sure both parties will send back support contracts with the uh, the answers. But um, <laughs> actually, there is a discussion page attached to the session. You can um, you can put comments in that page. Um, I'll point all of the presenters at that page um, and, and ask them to answer those questions when they come in. Um, That'd be great. I would like to point out one difference here, actually, that, that you bring up. Um, of the five tools here, I know CF Engine now has a commercial entity, although it's European-based. Um, Puppet, one, one big difference between Puppet and other tools is that we were, I founded the project and founded a company at the same time with the explicit point of having a tool that you can get commercial support behind. You can get a company that, you know, if, if Puppet's not, not satisfactory, then I can't feed my children. Um, so I, I have to make a good tool. I have to make a tool that, that people like. 
Um, and to me, this is a pretty important thing, and it's one of the reasons why we have a very open development environment. We have a very open community. Um, you know, it's, we very rarely reject patches. We only reject patches based on patch quality. Not, we, don't, we don't tell people, oh, we don't, we don't want that kind of functionality. We don't. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty different focus in the project, and it changes how we, we build the project and build the community. So, so quickly, does someone want to do the one-word version of what their license is? Really quickly, I should have done that at the start. Oh, GPL2. Uh, uh, Apache V2. BSD. GPL, and we have a U.S. Uh, subsidiary also. It's currently GPL, but I'm considering an MIT switch. Okay, so is there uh, more questions? I'll quickly uh, take one more question. Uh, one thing we haven't really talked about, and some people may not deal with that much, is describe the development uh, community that you deal with. Say, if I have a patch and I want to you know, add a new feature, you know, how open is your community? How nice is the community? How is <laughs> So the question was, what's the development community like? What's their style? Um, we have uh, published means of contributing patches and the entire life cycle from your conception of a patch to how it makes into into the contribution. We have multiple people who do code review. You email your patch to the list. Usually what you do is you open a ticket that describes what you want to do. Uh, that ticket goes through its own review process. Um, mostly James decides whether that's a good idea or not. And then... Uh, you, once you have the code done, you send the code to the list and you have people do code review. Once the list decides, okay, yeah, this code is acceptable, it's got all the sufficient patches and stuff, then it gets merged into trunk and gets sent into the next release. And it's, it's very open. I mean, we, again, we, we never reject people based on things like their names or whatever. So, so we have the, the same sort of thing. We have a couple of people that review submissions that come in. It typically comes through the ticketing system. And we try to be pretty friendly. One of the things about the BeaconFig community is that um, it wasn't really explicitly set up this way, but it turns out that a lot of the people that like using BeaconFig have a very similar sort of mindset about the way that things should be done. And so if you start interacting with BeaconFig users and you find that you agree with them, then you know it'll probably be a comfortable fit. Yeah, um, the Chef community, um, you know, the, I think the patch submission process is probably identical for all of us, right? So um, we use GitHub, you fork Chef, um, you write a patch. Um, one thing that we do do, we're Apache licensed. Um, one side effect of that for some Apache projects, it's true of Chef, is you need to fill out a CLA, um, which is just a contributor license agreement. The reason is that the Apache license talks uh, has some clauses about like basically patent clearance. Um, and so what it's essentially saying is that, you know, yes, I wrote this code. Um, yes, I'm allowing it to be distributed. If I then later go back and file a patent, then I've now granted a, a right to everybody else in the universe who's ever, who gets this code that they get it, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the actual community, you know, the process of getting patches in itself, um, we focus really a lot on the community oriented patches we get in. Um, we declare an MVP for every release. So if you contribute to Chef uh, and you're the one who in the community did the most work that release, then, you know, the last time we did it, we photoshopped a guy's head on top of LeBron James. So, you know, it's certainly entertaining. Um, the automated process is pretty simple. You can either send an email to me, to the mailing list, send me a patch, send uh, me a GitHub pull request. Uh, the actual process in terms of uh, accepting it is actually really simplistic. Uh, one of the things I will do is, you know, make sure that, so one of the things that makes automated interesting is that almost every single line of automated code has code coverage. There is a very exhaustive systematic test that I will run across many different OSs to make sure that it's doing the right thing. Because I had really horrible problems with at least two of the tools in this panel that were, they were not suitable for me to be able to run because they just had so many bugs. I think we all have better code coverage. I think we all have good code coverage at this point, right? Like, Do we? In the, okay, well. Yeah, I mean, anyway, in, in the 80s probably at least, if we're talking uh, like C0 code coverage. Um, so anyways, the, uh, the other cool thing though is that, you know, if if the way you're trying to use the tool disagrees with me in terms of you know what I want to roll into the core, that's not a problem because Automator tries to make it very easy for you to be able to include your own library. You pretty much drop in a file into the lib library and you can create your own classes. Okay, we might have to move on to Brendan. We're really short of time. Sorry. Originally, CF Engine was mostly written by Mark, and he had his own sort of arcane way of doing things, but that was a long time ago. Um, CF Engine's been in a version control system for quite some time. And uh, the <laughs> sorry, some of us think that's money. That he once said it was. He once said it was overhead. That was a while back. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been in a version control system for longer than most of the other tools have existed. So. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, in version two, the packaging code was entirely written by a third party contributor. And uh, we're, we're relatively open to patches. So uh, you can either send to the bugs list if you think it fixes things or to the help list if you think it adds things. Okay. Or both. Um, well, I'll wrap up there. As I said, there's a discussion page attached to the thing. These guys, uh, there's, there's lots of arguments online about this sort of stuff fairly really frequently, so I guarantee you'll get a response. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panellists for coming along, um, and thank you guys for coming along as well and listening. Um, and uh, next time, pop up with questions. If you're a panel, pop up with questions beforehand so we don't run into the situation running out of time. But again, thank you for your attendance and thank you for your participation. Cheers. Cheers.